today's presenters, Mario Sokas and Lindsay Stacy. Mario is a social worker with the Psychogeriatric Resource Consultation Program of the RGP. He's based out of UHN and has worked extensively with several long-term care homes in Toronto. And he has been instrumental in supporting the behavioral programs with these homes. He's also an experienced facilitator with many of the key training programs such as GPA and PCES. Lindsay is a psychogeriatric resource consultant with the RGP of Toronto. Prior to joining the PRC team, she worked in acute care as a behavioral consultant and has also worked as a PRC within the Mississauga Halton Lynn. Lindsay has many years of experience working in the field of geriatrics, including case management and transitional support. Now, before we get started, I'd like to let you know how to engage with our presenters today. Please feel free to type your questions or comments in the chat box at any time. We will start our question period around 4.45 p.m. Now, I will answer the most commonly asked question. Can we have a copy of the slides and recording for this webinar? Yes, we will send them to attendees and post them on the RGP Toronto website and YouTube channel. As a reminder, if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please email info at rgptoronto.ca. And with that, I'd like to invite Mario and Lindsay to take over. Hey, so thank you so much for the introductions. Welcome everybody. I'm just gonna get the slides ready here and we're good to go. So thank you for joining us today to discuss supporting residents with responsive behaviors during personal care. Uh, personal care has been one of those um, interactions with uh, residents that people who work with in dementia care find quite challenging at times. And it's really important for us to really understand what is the meaning behind the behavior so we can better support our residents with responsive behaviors during personal care. So Lindsay and I will be discussing this topic. We want to also take time to thank you. Thank you for supporting teams in long-term care during these very unprecedented times. As we know, this pandemic has really changed the face of long-term care and your support going in and, and helping the teams care for the residents during this pandemic is something that we really wanna thank you for. We'd also like to acknowledge the contributions, a few contributions to this webinar series. We'd like to acknowledge the Toronto Central Behavior Supports Ontario Coordinating Office, the Long-Term Care Behavior Support Outreach Team through the Toronto Central Lynn, and the Toronto Central and Central Lynn Behavior Supports Ontario leads that are, these are the in-house leads in long-term care that have really helped us in uh, developing this curriculum and have really identified areas that they find would be beneficial for us to have discussions on to support people being redeployed into long-term care. Just a few housekeeping items before we continue is, as Hazel mentioned earlier, the slide deck will be shared for you shortly following the training. And the webinar series is uh, posted on the RGP's YouTube channel. So if you'd like to go back to, to uh, listen to it again and to uh, reference, uh, look at some of the references, we welcome you to do so. Also, uh, the questions, please type the questions that are related to the content into the chat. There'll be plenty of opportunity for question and answer at the end of the webinar. Some things that we want to keep in mind is that we do recognize that there are maybe some case specific examples that you have already encountered um, in your redeployment that do require resolution. Unfortunately, we will not be addressing these cases because of the time. And also we want to, but what we also want to do is encourage you to connect with uh, the internal behavior supports in the long-term care home you're deployed at, as well as the external behavior supports that are providing um, support to the long-term care home to help you with these cases. So personal care, like I mentioned earlier, can be quite challenging at times. That's what uh, teams in long-term care have uh, brought up over the years uh, to us as PRCs. What we want to do is we really want to understand what is the resident's experience during personal care and how can we 
make it a better experience for them with certain strategies to consider when interacting with the person. And there are maybe some times that when you are providing support to the resident in personal care situations, that escalation can happen. We, in, the, in this webinar, we're going to be discussing some uh, strategies to consider in order to manage escalation. But we want to get to know you. We want to get to know who is here in this webinar, who's participating, who's joining us today. So we're going to put some questions up for you to, for us to get to know you a little better. So we're going to go with the first question, which is what is your role? What is your professional designation? Okay, so the poll results are up and it looks like there is a variety of professionals joining us in this webinar. Um, out of the group, about 33% are nurses, 17% uh, social work, 17% recreation therapists and activation. We have some psychogeriatric resource consultants joining us. So thank you for that. Um, now we're going to go into the next question. How many years of experience do you have working in the field? Okay, and in the room we have about 13% around zero to five, 25% uh, six to 10 years, 25% uh, 11 to 15, and 38% have 21 plus years of experience. Uh, so this really does speak to that there is a number of experience in the room, a wealth of experience in the room. Uh, and the next question we're gonna look at is, have you worked or supported older adults with dementia before? hundred percent have answered yes. So thank you for that. I just want to really draw the attention to the years of experience. Whether you have one month of experience or 21 plus years of experience, I'm sure working in the field of dementia care, you have come across uh, situations that uh, presented itself as challenging, but through you know teamwork and uh, through your creativity, you probably have found yourself um, getting out of some of these uh, challenging situations. So we really want to draw on that experience. And the final question is, have you attended previous webinars in this series? So 57% of participants have uh, attended previous webinar series. So for those, welcome back. It's great to have you back. And 43% answered no, and that's okay. We welcome you uh, to the first, uh, to your first um, part of the webinar series. What we do encourage you to do is uh, the RGP does have the YouTube channel where uh, the previous webinars have been archived. We do encourage you to go back to uh, have a look at those webinars and uh, the, the various topics that have uh, been discussed. So thank you for your participation. So now I want you to take some, a moment just to reflect. I want you to take a moment to reflect uh, about a time when you were examined by a healthcare provider. Now, we're not gonna ask you to answer this question in the chat box. What we want you to do is take a moment to self-reflect and think about, did you feel comfortable or uncomfortable when you were being examined? So take a moment to really think about that experience. As I mentioned earlier, you don't need to share in the larger group and take a moment to think about experience, this experience as we ask the next question, where if you were feeling uncomfortable, what were some things that may have made the experience uncomfortable for you? So what we'd like you to do is go to www.menti.com and use the barcode 58 
4717. What we'd like you to do is fill in what were some variables that made the experience uncomfortable for you. Something I should mention is that Menti is anonymous. So if you share, it's not going to be traced back to any particular user. So the results are coming in and I just really want you to take a moment just to really look at what participants are answering. So have a look at these uh, variables that have been mentioned here that made it a very uh, uncomfortable experience for you. This is what's being shared by uh, participants. I think it's fair to say that it's not in the intention of the healthcare provider to make you feel this way, but sometimes we become so habituated by what we are doing as clinicians, it may not connect with us the impact it's having on the person, just like with the healthcare provider examining us, it may not be um, really, they may not be really connecting with the impact this may be having on us. When we think about, I want you to think about what this exercise that we just did and really connecting it to what we're gonna be discussing as far as personal care is concerned. Personal care is really a broad term that's really used to refer to uh, supporting a person with their hygiene, their toileting, along with dressing and maintaining our personal appearance. It can cover, but it's not really limited to just bathing and showering. It could, could include bed baths, it could include toileting, it could even include using a commode or a bed pen. Um, now, when we think about personal care, we must recognize that there are many different forms, as mentioned here, but for the purposes of this presentation, the three that we will be focused on are toileting, bathing, and dressing. Now, personal care, there have been situations where responsive behaviors um, um, have been exhibited. Something that we would like to acknowledge is that term responsive behaviors and that all behavior has meaning. This is a concept that we've talked about in previous webinars. So for those two of you who are returning, uh, we will be discussing it again because it is really important for us to really re-emphasize this information because it really does guide our understanding of the experience of the person with responsive behaviors. Now, the term responsive behaviors is a term that we use to really better understand the person's experience and what are the unmet needs, the responses to these unmet needs that a person is trying to communicate with their behaviors. Now, something we need to keep in mind is that when a person does exhibit behaviors, a person with dementia exhibits behaviors, sometimes the person gets labeled by that behavior. Some examples would be that the person is labeled as being aggressive, inappropriate, they're a hoarder, they're agitated, um, they're, they're resistive to care, they're combative. And these, in these care situations, 
the person, when they are exhibiting these so-called behaviors, the person may be actually grabbing onto something or someone out of the fear, but it is getting labeled as being resistive to care. These labels, they really can be judgmental and really prevents us from seeking the meaning behind the behavior. Labels can also really give us these preconceived notions about the person, which can affect how we initially interact with the person before we even start to care. When we use a term like responsive behaviors and looking at behavior as having a meaning behind it, we're starting to move away from judging the person exhibiting the behavior towards understanding their actions have purpose and meaning. And that, and I start to appreciate that the person has the ability to express their experience. Yes, it is with behaviors, but they are expressing their experience nonetheless. So this is a concept of behavior support that's derived from 20 plus years of evidence-based research. And we really wanna highlight that behaviors occur due to the changes in the brain and the effects of, on specific brain structures. As the person goes through the disease process, different parts of the brain become affected and what we are seeing as, as a result of those changes. Now, something else we have to recognize is sometimes dementia care can feel like it's very time consuming and resource intensive. However, when we make connections with the person with dementia and we, we, we solve, we come up with solutions to uh, supporting a person with responsive behaviors, it can actually be very rewarding. Something we need to recognize is that when we're working with a person with dementia, they are a unique individual. They say that when you've met one person that has dementia, you've only met one person that has dementia. The strategies that we're gonna outline in this webinar really does offer tips and ideas to consider when interacting. However, again, this is a unique individual. Knowing the person behind the illness can really enhance opportunities for successful interactions during care. It's really important for us to really think about how can we connect with the teams that are caring for the resident in long-term care to learn more about who is this person behind the illness and is there an individualized care plan to support a person with responsive behaviors. As I mentioned earlier, yes, it can be time consuming, but when we learn more about the person, it could lead to positive rewarding outcomes at the end. Another concept that we talked about in previous webinars that we feel is really important for us to bring up again is in relation to personal care is the ABCs of brain function. When a person responds to a situation, it can be because of how a person, what a person's feeling and what a person's thinking at any given time. Now, something to keep in mind is what a person is feeling can affect what they're thinking at the end of the day, but also what a person's thinking can affect how a person feels at the end of the day, which will ultimately uh, affect the behavior response that we're seeing. I want you to think back to that mentee exercise about what made the experience of being examined so uncomfortable. You may have felt really uncomfortable during the process. However, you did not act on your discomfort. We didn't yell at the healthcare provider. We didn't strike out. We sat there and we, we knew why we were being examined. We knew what we were there for, even though we were feeling uncomfortable in that situation. Now, a person living with dementia, they may not be able to cognitively process what's happening and how they're feeling. Therefore, the behavior that we're seeing, it's emotionally driven. We see more of a fight or flight response. We may not be able to change what a person thinks at that moment, but how we respond to them, we do have the opportunity to change how they feel in that situation. Now, it's really important for us to remember that, emotion, that behavior is emotionally driven and it really is not volitional. The changes in the brain due to the progression of the disease, it really does correlate with the behaviors that we are seeing at the end of the day. The behavior is not towards you, but our interactions with the person experiencing dementia can cause them to respond to how the interaction is interpreted in their world. So it's really important for us to relate this to personal care and how they're perceiving personal care. The person may not be able to process what is happening, why are we there? Why are we removing their clothes? Or even for the fact that they actually need help, they may not be able to process that. It's also important to consider that during the pandemic, there may not be consistency in the people providing care to the person, which does affect the person's experience with care. Now, what we know is that when a person is, uh, has, there's a consistent care provider for the person with dementia, 
if there's enough positive interactions with that person, the person may not necessarily remember the care provider, but they may feel the sense of familiarity. And if it's a positive familiarity, the likelihood of the person of, uh, being uh, cooperative with care, it increases. So on that note, I'm gonna pass it on to Lindsay uh, to, to discuss some of the losses that we see with the person who has uh, um, dementia and how that might impact care. So Lindsay, on to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Mario. I'm just gonna share my slides here. So now I'm going to take you through some of the losses that individuals with dementia might experience. We're gonna look at some of those common behaviors that we might see and then some of the common responses that we often hear. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the strategies to consider when responding to those behaviors. So for a loss of insight, this first one here, this is a person's lack of ability to understand and perceive one's own condition or illness. And typically with this loss, we often see a person who's refusing to do something or insisting that they've already done it. And this can be very frustrating for, for you as the care provider, because even though you can't recognize, or sorry, the person can't recognize their losses or the fact that they need assistance, typically intervention or support is necessary. So when we think about uh, toileting, a behavior we might see is a person has soiled themselves, but they don't think that they need to be changed. A common response we hear is someone saying to the person in public place, so something like a common room, don't sit there, you soiled yourself. We need to change your diaper. And a strategy to consider instead would be, join me for a walk, let's get you freshened up before lunch. So you're redirecting the individual before you sit down as opposed to embarrassing them in front of the other residents. And you also wanna be mindful of the language you're using. So in this situation, we might have said, um, we need to change your diaper, but instead of saying that, you want to say something like a brief or an adult brief. For bathing, something we might see is a person hasn't taken a shower in over two weeks. And we've all heard that resident say, you know, I showered yesterday or I showered this morning. And they're not trying to be difficult, they just don't think that they need help and they might have forgotten, so they don't understand why you're trying to help them. And a common response we often hear is, you need to shower, it's been two weeks. So a strategy to consider would be, you told me you like going to the spa and you have a spa appointment, so why don't we walk there together? And oftentimes I find that we need to get creative and instead of saying words like bath or shower, we might wanna try something that we know they like. So if this person likes a spa, because it can really help us in this situation. And also setting up their shower time as an appointment, I find is a really good strategy because they're less likely to cancel because you're already there waiting for them. And then you also wanna make sure that you follow through on what you said. So if you're taking them to their spa appointment, you wanna ensure that the tub room is set up accordingly. So you could have the tub running with warm water, consider where the towels are placed, you might play some soft music if possible, consider some scents or aromas, and you could also dim the lighting. And this is really an opportunity for you guys as redeployed team members to connect with the frontline staff to find out what method uh, each person prefers. And again, it really just points to knowing the person and finding what works, for, uh, for what works best for them. For dressing, a behavior we may see is the person wears the same clothes every day. And a common response we, we might say is, your clothes are dirty and they need to be washed. A strategy to consider is scheduling a FaceTime or Zoom call with that person's family and saying, your daughter is going to be seeing you today. Why don't you wear that blue shirt that she loves? And this is such a great way to get that person to change out of that shirt that they originally put on because they're going to be able to resonate with that emotion of seeing their daughter and wanting to look nice for her. Overall, I think the most important thing is that we need to be supportive. So we want to recognize that some days are going to be better than others. And we, we need to remember that this individual is not being difficult on purpose. They truly just believe that they are well and that they don't need any help. So for environmental misperceptions, uh, people with dementia may start to have troubles perceiving different things in their environment. And this will look differently depending on the person. So it might be delusions or hallucinations. It could be suspicious or paranoid behavior 
And it could even be um, having de uh, poor depth perception, which is what I'm going to focus on right now. So for toileting, a behavior we might see is a person voids in the garbage, in the garbage can next uh, to the toilet. And a common response we hear is, the toilet is right next to you. Why did you pee in the garbage? A strategy to consider is using a dark colored toilet seat or even using bright signage to indicate the word toilet. So people living with dementia and those with poor vision may find it difficult to, to see the toilet, especially if the bathroom is all white. So they might only see a flat surface rather than the actual bowl with water in it. So using a dark colored toilet seat on the white base can really make the toilet more visible and identifiable for the person. And also using the sign above a toilet can be a benefit to those with dementia, especially if they become disoriented to their surroundings. So we want to make sure that the signage is in a contrasting color to the wall, so something that is really bright. You could use both words and pictures and also ensure that it's clearly visible and positioned in the person's line of vision. For bathing, a behavior we might see is a person hitting, kicking, and screaming when being put into the bathtub. And a common response we hear is, stop it, you need a bath. A strategy to consider would be using other methods of bathing. And I know, Mario, you said this earlier as well. So you could try a bed bath or a sponge bath. Um, these are both effective ways to get a person clean. You could also try a seven day shower where you're focusing on one part of the body each day and then rotating throughout the week. And there's so many different ways to wash a person and often it really takes a team approach and you have to be creative. Um, and the lack of contrast, um, like I mentioned, especially in a bathtub or a shower can really make it challenging for a person with dementia. So placing a colored bath mat in the tub to distinguish where the bottom of the tub is can really help and it also minimizes the risk of falls as well. I also like to suggest using a piece of colored tape or even putting a colored towel on the side of the tub because that can also be helpful. For dressing, a behavior um, we might see is a person ripping off their scarf that has a print on it yelling, snake! And a common response might be, there are no snakes in here, while putting the scarf back on the person. So what we need to realize is that the person may be misperceiving the scarf as a snake because of the pattern on it or even because of the shape of it. So a strategy to consider would be taking the scarf away or consider replacing it with a solid colored scarf. And the key thing to note here is that this example is a person who is misperceiving an object. And that is very different than someone who is having a hallucination. So a hallucination is more of a sensory experience or, um, or a perception in the absence of an external, external stimulus. So it appears real to the person, but it's actually created in their mind and they're seeing an image that isn't real. So I'll give you another example of misperception. So um, if you go into a person's room and they have the TV on and they think the people on the TV are actually in the room with them. So it's really important to be aware of this and to scan the person's environment to see if there is something that the person might be misperceiving and then either remove it or change it. So this next slide is about um, the loss of pur purposeful movement um, that can happen in people that live with dementia. And this is a common cognitive issue where the body can't respond to messages that are normally sent from the brain. So it becomes increasingly difficult to, be to complete some of those basic tasks that they used to be able to do. So for toileting, a behavior we commonly see is a person sitting on the toilet before pulling down their pants. So they've completely missed that step of, you know, um, before sitting down. And sometimes we forget that there is that disconnect in the brain. And so a common response we see is you need to pull your pants down first. And a strategy to consider would be instead to guide the person step by step using short, simple instructions, while also ensuring that you pause between each step. And again, you need to get creative here because sometimes I find that this process really tends to happen so quickly where you're guiding the person to the toilet and then they immediately sit down. And then it's a lot more difficult to actually get them to stand back up so you can pull their pants down. So before this happens, you might wanna try something like asking the person to grab onto the grab bars that are on the wall or 
even holding onto their walker. And this way you can let them know that you're going to help them with their pants before they sit down. For bathing, a behavior we might see is a person is able to do parts of the shower, but is pushing your hand away and saying no. And we know that bathing is a complex task that is made up of so many different steps. So a person living with dementia, the sequencing of these tasks may become too difficult and then the person becomes overwhelmed. So um, a common response we might see is, why are you pushing me? I'm only trying to help. So some strategies to consider are simplifying the task of bathing. So you could use hand over hand to really guide the person in completing some of those tasks. I find this is really helpful um, when someone has forgotten some of those required steps. You could also use gestures to break down instructions and facilitate participation. Um, and I know this goes a long way. The individual is still likely able to bathe themselves. We just need um, to help them a little bit in getting started and break down those steps. So when a person is experiencing a loss of purposeful movement, sequencing the steps of getting dressed in the right order often becomes impaired. So for dressing, a behavior that we might see is a person um, wears multiple layers of clothing and they might wear their underwear on top of their pants. A common response we hear is, you're wearing too much. Why are you wearing your underwear over your pants? So for these types of situations, we really wanna take a step back and ask ourselves, why is this behavior happening? You know, maybe the person's cold or maybe they've forgotten how to dress properly. So a strategy to consider would be laying out the person's clothes in order of sequence to help them remember those steps. Another strategy is limiting the amount of clothing that they have access to. So for this, you could remove some of the clothing from their um, closet that might not be appropriate for the current season and then pick out two outfits and give the person a choice between the two. And this way they still feel in control and it also promotes independence. So for all of these situations, it's important to recognize that the person may appear that they don't wanna do the task and then they often get labeled as difficult, right? Because their behavior is their way of telling you that they don't know how to do the task and that they might, might need some help. So you wanna recognize what the person can do for themselves and then allow them to do it. And if you notice that doing a task has just become too difficult for the individual to understand and you sense a lot of frustration, then you, you're gonna wanna find an alternative way to do those tasks. And this is where you get to be creative. So for loss of recognition, the person often has trouble recognizing uh, people, objects, and places. So I'm gonna take you through these three examples. So for toileting, a behavior we might see is a person digging into their incontinent product and smearing uh, yeah, I do. okay. And uh, smearing feces in their room. I just wanted to make sure I moved the slide, which I did. Um, in individuals who have dementia at times, they might not recognize that they are having a bowel movement. And so in trying to relieve that discomfort and clean up, they're actually smearing their feces on the walls and the other surfaces around them. And so a common response we often hear is, what are you doing? Don't do that. And a strategy to consider would be our toileting routine. So for example, every two to three hours. <clears throat> and a toileting routine I find is the best response in this situation as it can really help prevent constipation. And it also ensures that the individual gets cleaned up immediately after having a bowel movement. And again, it, it may seem time consuming. I know Mario mentioned this earlier, um, but taking the time to really follow a toileting routine will actually save you time in the long run. And while you also may feel extremely upset that this has happened, you want to make sure that you stay calm and you stay, um, you know, matter of fact, and that you don't scold the person. For bathing, a behavior we might see is a person has mistaken the shampoo bottle for a beverage and then begins drinking the shampoo. And a common response we hear is, stop that, that will make you sick. So a strategy to consider is pouring the shampoo into their hand and using gestures to cue what to do with it. So you really wanna show them where they need to put the shampoo. For dressing, a behavior we might see is a person puts their underwear on top of their head thinking it's a hat. And a common response we have is correcting the behavior, right? We wanna say, you know, that's not what you're doing. Um, so that's your underwear, that's not a hat. 
And in these instances, we're actually reacting with a response that is emotionally driven. It's not normal for us, so we react, right? But what we need to remember is that for this person, this behavior makes complete sense. So a strategy to consider would be giving the person one item at a time and then using gestures and visual cues um, for where to put the item. And again, you wanna promote that independence as much as possible. So guide them through each step um, and allow them to do it themselves. So some other strategies to consider when assisting with personal care routines. So you want to consider the time, the time of day when personal care is being provided. This is super important. And I know that a lot of people want to follow the person's prior bathing habits and their schedule, and we do want to do that as much as possible. But you also want to pay attention to their fatigue levels. So for example, if the person is always bathed at night, but now you're finding that they're more exhausted or they're more confused during this time, you might want to try switching it up and doing it at a different time of day. And also try scheduling their shower either at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day to avoid that unnecessary dressing and redressing in the middle of the day because this can often be tiring and also very confusing for the person. But again, it's going to vary depending on the individual. Another point to mention is that the person might be experiencing pain and this can create many challenges for the person when completing their personal care. So if the person is on pain medications, you really want to consider the timing of when their medication is being administered and how soon personal care is being provided afterwards. And oftentimes it's recommended to provide care 30 to 45 minutes after the medication has been administered. The second point is physical causes for behavior have been addressed. So as a person's dementia progresses, it really becomes more difficult for them to communicate to others when they are in pain. And this can cause their pain to go undetected and untreated. So this is often when you start to see behaviors because it's their way of telling you that they're in pain. So you always wanna be assessing for physical changes. So things like an infection or other medical causes, especially if you start to see something new or a sudden change in the person's behavior. And we know that pain is such a huge contributing factor to responsive behaviors. So we always need to be considering it as a possible cause. And then keeping to past routines. So it's important to learn about the person's past routines and follow it as much as possible to make it feel familiar for them. So maybe consider how the person started their day in the past. What was their morning routine like? Did they, did they like to shower or did they like to bath? What time did they like to do these things? These are all things that really should be taken into account when providing care. And all of us, if we think about ourselves, we all have our own routines that we rely on. And it can be very uncomfortable when these, when these things are changed. So we really need to think about the people we're caring for in that same way as well. And then allow independence. So giving the person as much control and encouraging independence with their personal care routine is so crucial. So for example, in the shower, a person might not be able to wash their feet or their back, but maybe they're able to hold the shower head to help rinse themselves, or maybe they can wash their face. So you really want to find the ways that, uh, that encourage independence. And then also remember that some days will be better than others. Just because a person can't complete a task today doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to do it tomorrow. So you really want to give them that opportunity to, to do it independently first before assuming that you know, we have to take over and give them complete assistance. So some other strategies to consider. So positive reinforcement. So when we think of positive reinforcement, we want to be focusing on the things that an in individual is still able to do. So what we, um, what we could do is offer a small reward or a verbal praise. So for example, I love the outfit you picked out. You look so lovely in red. And this is going to really reinforce the fact that they picked out their outfit themselves. Another example could be, Mario, I know how much you love watching, and then I'm going to state his favorite movie. Once you're finished with the shower, I'm going to turn on that movie for you. So I'm providing a reward for when the shower is done. The second thing here says knock on the door and introduce yourself. So we need to remember that this is the person's home and we need to be respectful of that. So we want to make sure we're knocking before we enter their room. 
we're introducing ourselves at every single interaction. And again, we probably need to do this more than once. So for example, as I'm knocking on the door, I might say, hi, Hazel, my name is Lindsay and I'm your nurse today. Can I come in to see you? So you wanna make sure that you're asking for their permission. Explain in simple words why you're there. So once I'm inside the room, you wanna make sure you adjust, um, you want to make sure that they're adjusting to your presence by being personable. So I'm gonna start by asking how they're doing or even giving them a compliment. And then only after that can you proceed with explaining why you're there and starting with those personal care tasks. So for example, today is your spa day, Hazel. Would you like to walk with me? And also make sure that you're speaking slowly and clearly and also avoid using any slang language as this can be really confusing for the person. Allow time for the person to process the information. So it might take a person with dementia more time to process the information and work out their response, but you don't wanna interrupt the person. And if they don't respond, it's okay to ask the question again and then wait. And then be mindful of sensory, sensory losses and changes. And this is so important when thinking about the bathing experience. A person with dementia may become more sensitive to things like water hitting them. And so, something you could do is covering half of the shower head to decrease that water pressure that's hitting them. And you want to be aware of those sensitive spots and provide a warning to them before you touch them. So Mario, I need to lift your right arm to wash underneath and then I'm going to wash, watch his um, face for any facial changes and then I'm going to provide reassurance. So I might say something like, I'm so sorry Mario, I know this is causing you pain. I'm almost done. And that's just going to let Mario know that I'm paying attention and that, I'm, that I care about him. And again, I also want to highlight the importance of making sure that the person has been given their pain medications prior to care being provided. If this is done, if this is not done, sorry, no matter how much reassurance we provide, the person's probably going to still exhibit responsive behaviors as their way of expressing that pain. So this, this is such an important point. And to be honest, if there's anything you take away from this webinar, I really hope you remember this point. So always keep the dignity of the person in mind. And what I mean by that is that we're caring for individuals with unique needs and experiences and desires. And it's so important that we're ensuring our residents are receiving respectful and compassionate, personal, emotional, and spiritual care that they need. So we want to make sure that we know the individual and we know how to communicate with them. And I know this can be very challenging, especially during these times, but we need to be reading each person's care plan before providing care. And also watching our language and the words that we're using. So for example, I, I mentioned it earlier, but things like diaper, this can really um, come across as infantilizing and we don't want to use that. So use something different like an adult brief. And then respect the person's privacy. So again, knocking before you enter their room, covering them with a towel during care, and then also recognize that this is a change for them and they likely don't want to be naked in front of a stranger, which we probably wouldn't either, right? And then build on the person's strengths and abilities. And this is gonna encourage a sense of feeling useful and valued and that's exactly what we want. So, we recognize that no matter how much sensitivity and care is put into the personal care process, there are times when it's going to be considerably challenging. And in these instances, we wanna be mindful of a person escalating during interaction and recognize when we need to stop what we're doing and step at least two arms length away from the person. So oftentimes I like to ask the question, why do we expect the person to stop reacting when we're not stopping what we're doing? So stepping away really offers that instant relief for both the person and the staff. And then don't approach them or re-approach them, sorry, um, to resume that care unless you're gonna try something different because you're gonna get the same outcome. And then leave the person alone, but obviously making sure it's safe to do so first. So someone who's sitting on the toilet or in the bathtub, this might not be a safe situation to leave entirely. So this is when you just wanna step away from the person. If it is safe to leave, however, like if the person's sitting on their bed while you're helping them dress, um, maybe try using a statement like, I'm sorry if I upset you. It looks like this is not the right time for me, so I'm going to come back shortly. 
and then avoid correcting mistakes and telling them that they're wrong. So we really want to avoid statements like, you need to do this now and you need my help. Honestly, this is only going to upset the person further. And then lastly, the behavior is a personal expression to an uncomfortable and perceived potential threatening situation. And this really just summarizes that foundational principle of behavioral support that Mario stated earlier. And that's recognizing that all behaviors are meaningful and reflect a desire to communicate something. So we need to be watching and listening and really making an active effort to figure out what it is that they're trying to say to us. All right, so now I just want to draw your attention to some other resources that are going to be helpful for you. So the first one on the, the slide there is the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto. Their website has some excellent resources under the COVID-19 resources section, and it's updated regularly. Um, the Regional Geriatric Program YouTube channel, so that's where this webinar as well as the past three webinars will be posted. So if you did miss them, I encourage you to go watch them there. The covidcarelearning.ca has some excellent resources as well. So things like COVID-19 resources, redeployment, orientation to long-term care. And again, these are also updated regularly. And I believe you need to have a contact, um, contact them for an access code. The Alzheimer's Society Canada website has great resources that are specific to dementia. So I definitely encourage you to look that up. And then the last one is bathing without a a battle. So this is a free um, online training, a series of videos that you can complete. I think it's about two and a half hours and you can do it at your own time. Um, and it really provides person-centered practical approaches to care. And the thing to note here is that it is an American website. So when you're putting in your address, it will ask for a zip code. I just put in my, um, my Canadian postal code and it works. So you can still do that. Um, and if you're not a registered nurse or if you don't work, um, in that field or if you work in a different healthcare profession, you can still receive the free training. You just don't get a certificate or a continuing education credit for it. So you would just hit the other option to specify which profession you're on. And so that's the end of our webinar. And we really hope that you found it helpful and that um, you'll be able to take some of this knowledge back to the long-term care home that you've been redeployed to. And we would like to know if this webinar was helpful for you. And so if you have other topics that you'd be interested in, please tell us in the chat box. Thank you, Mario and Lindsay, for your thoughtful processing and suggestions for supporting residents with responsive behaviors during care. You both have highlighted the need to know the person and the meaning behind the behaviors to make it a positive experience for both the residents and the care providers. Now we do have some time for questions. Please continue to type your comments or questions in the chat box for our presenters. Just a reminder, while typing your questions in the chat box, please make sure you have first changed the to selection from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your questions. Now, while we wait for you to type your questions, I'll start us off with one. Lindsay, you talked about the loss of insight and how this, how this difficulty can present during showering. I'm wondering whether you can elaborate on it and share if you have any other strategies to suggest. Yeah, thanks, Hazel. I think the, you know, the, that is such a good question to ask, sorry. <laughs> um, and I think I shared some, uh, definitely shared some different tips, but some other things that I'm thinking of are um, really thinking about your approach ahead of time. So if you know that person, um, really want to think about what are, what are some hooks or what are some rewards that might get that person to do the tasks that you're asking them to do. Um, so this could be like a FaceTime call with their family. It could be, you know, their favorite dessert. Um, so those are things you could offer. Um, also thinking about a behavior uh, or sorry, a bathing chart. Um, so really posting that on the wall and then letting them know that you're going to be back at a certain time. I think that's really helpful. And then another thing I really like to do is, um, you know, tell the person like, oh, you have a stain on your shirt. So I find that if they know that there's something on their shirt, they're more likely to help you take it off. Um, so those are some of the strategies that I use. And then another key one that I like to use is I, I look really young. And so I will often say to the person, 
you know, I'm a student and I really need your help. Um, if you could show me how to do this, you know, I find that a lot of, a lot of the time people will be more open to, um, helping you out. So. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. I, Meantime, I'm going to ask you another question. This was the question, um, this came up in the morning session. I thought it's a great question. Maybe we can discuss that a bit. Uh, the question is, when a person has lost insight as a result of dementia, does that mean they lose insight into all areas of their life? Mario, would you like to respond to this question? Sure, Hazel, thank you. Um, so when we think about a person who has dementia, just because they've lost insight on one aspect, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a global insight loss. Um, and what we think that the person may have lost some insight on at that moment today, on another day, they might have some insight to it. So it, it really goes on a case by case basis. And I think what's really important is for us to communicate with the person, get to know the person, um, ask those questions, and uh, hear what the responses are for us to understand where they're at. They say everybody is a unique person, so you can't really say just, just because somebody has any illness that causes the symptoms of dementia that they've lost total insight on all aspects of their life. So it's, again, it's really just important to ask those questions and see where that person is at. Thank you, Mario. Yeah, um, I just want to add a little bit to that. I agree with everything that Mario said that really our capacity and our insight is really always changing, you know, day to day. And just keep in mind that as the disease progresses as well, it's going to become more prominent and it's going to affect more parts of their life. So um, that's just something to keep in mind as well. Thank you, Lindsay. If you don't have any more questions, maybe we can wrap up. Thank you. It's time to start wrapping up now. And we want to thank you for attending this webinar and participating. We really appreciate it. We want to thank both Mario and Lindsay for the excellent learning opportunity. I'm sure many here have some tips to take away. You will also receive a short evaluation survey by email. Please take a few moments and complete the survey to give us some in some feedback. We'll also appreciate if you share your suggestions for future webinars. And we want to take this opportunity to thank you for supporting the long-term care homes during this COVID-19 situation. We want to invite you to attend the next webinar in the COVID-19 long-term care orientation series on Tuesday, June 23rd. The webinar is on supporting residents with responsive behaviors during feeding and medication administration with Heli Uola and Sasha Johnston. Registration information for this webinar will be emailed soon. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks again and see you next time.